financial services in the 40 countries where ADB are working, um, one of those countries being Georgia. Uh, and I, I was very fortunate to spend a few months uh, in Georgia earlier this year, um, you know, trying to understand a bit more about the economy, but also uh, just for personal reasons, I have I have some uh, friends there and lived for, for a while um, throughout throughout the uh, North Caucasus with, with my family as well. Um, so uh, yeah, really delighted to be here, Anthony, and, and looking forward to uh, the presentation and, and any questions anyone might have. Thank you very much for that. And uh, uh, I'm delighted with the opportunity for Grigor and myself to uh, uh, to collaborate on this. Um, I think the breadth of expertise that Grigor brings is uh, going to be terrifically helpful. Um, he's very busy at the moment, uh, finishing off a rather large project, but uh, we're going to be uh, uh, developing our collaboration over the next uh, months. So a little bit, I'll go through these slides fairly briefly because uh, this is information I'm sure many of you uh, know. Um, open banking originated, funnily enough, uh, in Europe with the uh, PSD2. Um, I say funnily enough because the UK has the stronger reputation, and that's because Europe didn't introduce the levels of uh, support for the ecosystem uh, that the UK did. Uh, the UK had this brilliant idea, which the banks didn't like, uh, of making the banks pay for the implementation, part of the payback, if you like, for the financial crisis in 2008. Um, and that worked quite well. But the important thing to recognise is that the UK did not do it perfectly. They did a lot very well, and clearly they did at least initially better than uh, than in Europe in terms of implementation, and arguably that's still the case in terms of adoption of services. Um, however, we could see in retrospect, a lot of things could have been done better. And it's those lessons learned that uh, we like to specialize in. Um, now, we started applying those lessons in Brazil, where I worked uh, uh, to help uh, establish things there, particularly the security infrastructure. And then Australia, my friends at Radium, uh, one of the directors um, is Australian, and uh, he went over to work uh, in Australia, having established it in the UK. So those countries are developing, as uh, Gregor pointed out, there are many more. It's now spreading across the world. Now, I wanted to try and indicate why I personally, having researched it as a consequence of meeting Gregor, realising that Georgia is a really good place to uh, invest time and energy in helping support the development of open banking, which, as you may have gathered, is a subject that's close to my heart. Georgia is one of the top 10 economies in the world in the terms of ease of doing business. The tax environment is supportive, high level of education and a strong desire for change within a democratic uh, infrastructure. Those are all important things. I've worked in some countries that have that kind of capability, others are not quite so strong. I suppose the most recent example in which I've worked is Chile, where again, you could argue that some of the characteristics are rather similar. So there are a number of social drivers. There's a strong technological infrastructure. Uh, there's a, a, an excellent digital infrastructure, high mobile connectivity, ID ownership, which incidentally is really important for open ecosystems in general. <clears throat> in other words, if you're dealing with somebody, say, on a healthcare open ecosystem, how do you know it's the same person as on the uh, open finance or the open banking ecosystem? That's actually quite a challenge in the UK where we don't have uh, digital IDs. And that's uh, that, that's an issue. Other countries do. Um, uh, there's a supportive startup uh, ecosystem. And uh, here I'd like to uh, give a, a quick shout out to uh, my colleague, David Kikvitze, who's been very helpful. Uh, he's uh, uh, responsible for the uh, Georgian uh, FinTech Association. So uh, welcome to the uh, call, David. And uh, good to see you. Good. Quick hi to everybody. Hello. <laughs> hello. Thank you. Thank That's you, a, Anthony. It's a pleasure. Thank you for thank you for inviting and thank you for this really word words about the Georgia and uh, 
let me a little bit introduce myself and my country and our ecosystem yes. as well. Yes, please, yes. So, um, hello everyone, once again, glad to meet you and looking forward to meet you personally in Georgia. Uh, I will be glad to see you in our country and um, I will be happy, more than happy to be your host in Georgia and uh, we will, I will try my best to show you our brilliance of our country. So I'm a David, as I already mentioned, I'm a chairman of the FinTech Association of Georgia. I'm at the same time, I'm a Open Banking Committee member on behalf of TBC Bank. TBC Bank is one of the largest commercial banks in our country. And at the same time, I'm a business advisor in terms of entire action of FinTech. I am helping the different kinds of uh, FinTech companies to establish in our country, develop the proper business model to be a compliance with this existing regulations in our country and helping them to get the proper license to operate in our country. So, uh, the, Anthony has mentioned already that the really Georgia is um, uh, past past several years. Our country is make some really big steps in terms of fintech development. We established the um, uh, almost all international regulations, which are already um, running in Europe and US, and we are very very rapidly looking uh, forward to be uh, some kind of hub of fintech development for our region. Yeah. So in this terms, um, we already, as you know, we have already finished the open banking project first step. It means that the PSD2, we are uh, in PSD2 regulations, we are all in compliance. So this, this kind of regulation is already adopted, fully adopted in our country. And in this terms, the open banking services, including payment initiation, payment information, account information, card information, uh, clients identification, verification services and etc. is already adopted and all commercial banks has already created the open APIs for the services. At the current stage, we are already start working about the uh, second stage of the open finance and in this regard, um, already the banking association who runs this project generally, already starting the preparation of the technical document, which we are, we will be obligatory for the all commercial banks. And we are already started the working about this project. Also, in past year, we adopted the uh, open banking, uh, particularly open banking regulation, which means the particular rules and uh, um, uh, rules of including in open banking for the third parties. And also we adopt the open um, communication and networking regulation. Uh, I don't remember exactly. It's a very long, um, <laughs> long name of this regulation. So yeah. it's some kind of uh, regulation about the technical um, compliance for the third parties and uh, commercial banks as well, uh, which included all kind of um, technical and legal moments, how to any third party can be involved in open banking and take this uh, APIs from the commercial banks. This is our current situation. The most important challenges which we have at the current stage is the awareness of the open banking. I'm sure it's the same situation in all around the world, including UK, including uh, European Union. So uh, at the current stage, our association as well and the National Bank of Georgia and Banking Association, we have trying our best to uh, attract the interest of the third parties, uh, fintech companies to be involved in open banking. For example, at the current stage, we have three ongoing projects under our association's umbrella, which we're helping the fintech companies to get the license uh, from the MBG to be a part of the open banking. And um, I hope so this um, tendency will be moved forward and um, many companies will be uh, interested to uh, engage in open banking and uh, it's really uh, should be created alternative financial system, some kind of transformative financial system in, in our country. So a um, little I, bit more. Sorry, David, I may need to stop you at that point, but we'll have no plenty problem. of uh, opportunities for uh, conversation. You've rather neatly, I think, also uh, said some of the things that uh, may well be yeah, cropping yeah. up uh, in a minute. But thank you very much for your time. Thank you. And thank hopefully you. Sorry we'll for have... the long. No, long, no, that's long, quite long all right. Words, that's yeah. cool. Thank you. So thank you thank for you. that. So supportive regulator, no, 
Thank you, David. You did a great job at that uh, <laughs> because uh, he's, uh, we've, uh, you know, I, I'd like to mention the, uh, the the strong support of the National Bank, which uh, David's uh, touched on, supervisory function. I've been looking at that, and that's a, a pretty good document. It's a good, sensible uh, uh, approach, which I think uh, uh, gives a high probability of uh, of success, and certainly the framework within which we can develop that success. These things can be done in many ways. We'd love to help support them being done in the most effective way possible. And financial inclusion is a big deal to us as well. Uh, and so a financial inclusion strategy, this is very important. Um, we can touch on some of this uh, shortly. So I'd like to hand over now to uh, to Grigor, who's uh, going to describe some of the uh, uh, the details of his research. Grigor, if you don't mind, if we could cover this in, I don't know, say five minutes, do you think? Would that be yeah. all right? Yeah. Thank absolutely. you. Thank um, you. Sure. So uh, what I'm currently working for, uh, the uh, the study I'm currently doing for the Asian Development Bank um, is to kind of benchmark countries and create an index to uh, assess the development of digital financial services across um, the 40 countries where they work and um, this is just a, a draft sketch of what um, the, the Georgian, uh, where the strengths are in the Georgian fintech sector uh, according to this research. So as, um, as Anthony mentioned, you know, there's very strong digital infrastructure as well with the ID system, um, strong payment systems, you know, uh, that that technical, uh, technical systems are there. Um, there's a financial inclusion strategy that's uh, been developed by the government and, and the central bank together, very strong uh, financial literacy programs and basically a lot of support coming from, from the public sector, I think, um, you know, sending a s strong signal to, to the private sector that, you know, it's encouraging uh, development in, uh, in financial technology and uh, digital financial services. Um, so the the regulatory support I think available from the um, national bank is 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 really good. Lots of excellent policy papers, documents, technical standards um, being published. There's a fintech association, uh, of course, represented by David. Um, you know, bringing the the different um, elements of the system together. And then where um, I think that there is uh, room room for improvement. So the the fintech ecosystem, as I understand it, is quite small. I was only able to find about uh, 20 or so companies um, working in uh, fintech in, in, in the country. Um, but, you know, lo lots of already good uh, services provided by the um, by the main banks, so TSB and, uh, and, and, and others. <clears throat> but I think, um, you know, if we do see fintech grow, if we do see fintech flourish, I think there's lots of opportunity there for collaborations between uh, smaller companies, both within Georgia and potentially coming from uh, regional neighbours, working together to develop more localised services. And I, I think one of the things in the Georgian market is that many of many banks are foreign owned, and generally speaking, this might lead to um, well, what's happened at least in other countries is that there's not necessarily localised services that are developed, but maybe services that are more appropriate to wherever these banks are headquartered. So it's mm -hmm. always good to have local uh, local fintech service development to really address the you know specific needs of people, um, not not just in cities, but also in uh, in in the countryside uh, in Georgia as well. Um, and and. Uh, Sorry, uh, Anthony, could you go to the next Yes, slide? of course. Yes. I think that's an interesting point you make about uh, uh, the distribution of uh, fintechs. Um, it does tend to be the case that uh, in smaller countries, getting your own specific fintech uh, industry going can be a little bit of a challenge uh, because you know, it's, a, it's a smaller market. Um, we can do things about that. And of course, 
uh, as uh, David identified, Georgia can be a hub. So you're, you're, the market is not just your own country. The, the greater emphasis is on interoperability and becoming a hub for the region. Uh, this was an argument I was stating to my uh, colleagues in Ukraine and also in Chile, where if you do it right, you can be an example that all the other countries follow. Uh, so, Grigor, yes, please carry on. Yeah, thanks. So, um, so there's a lot of support uh, coming, I think, from from the public sector. There's a variety of schemes uh, funded by multilateral development institutions like the um, IFC, and there's all kinds of different kinds of funding available. Also, um, I think certain kinds of European Union funding that are available um, for for tech companies, for startups, um, you know, different kinds of uh, tech accelerator uh, support schemes. Um, but generally speaking, it can be um, a bit difficult to access capital in the market. I think you know there's examples of companies uh, from Georgia going going abroad, going to other countries. Uh, going even to the US and um, to access uh, capital investment from there. Um, also, the, the level of demand is not necessarily certain. So we know that about $17 um, million worth of digital loans was made in 2020, um, which is very high across the region. Um, but, but generally speaking, uh, the, the uptake, the usage of financial services ac across Georgia is is relatively low, so there may not be as much demand as um, that there is a potential supply for it, right? And uh, about um, eight percent of people only have saved at a financial institution. Um, so, so you know, there there is um, there is opportunity for fintechs, I think, to come in, help people save, help people build, you know, personal savings for themselves and for their families and move you know have that saving have those savings actually pay them interest so i think that, you know that there's, there's a lot of um, improvements that financial technology can 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 bring there for a lot of benefits for individuals um and there's strong incumbents so already very good digital financial services coming out of the main banks there's also space bank which has been set up as a kind of uh, individual standalone bank but um i believe that's a, a, a tbc project um, but, you know, potential opportunities for collaboration there between fintechs and those. Uh, so, uh, as I say, yeah, relatively constrained uh, capital investment, but but I think a lot of um, potential. I think George is very well placed to um, also access um, capital investment from, um, you know, from European companies as well as um, from from further afield as well. So, so um, maybe Anthony, I'll I'll pause there and. Yes, that's fine. Thank you. That that'd be perfect. I'll just skip this uh, uh, slide now then, and uh, let's uh, press on. Thank you. Now, uh, I think we could, with a bit of luck, if we do this right, find ourselves in a virtuous circle, whereby I believe if we're able to demonstrate that Georgia isn't just looking after. Georgia, but is becoming a regional hub that will attract additional investment because people will, uh, investors will see the broader potential and you can then take advantage of the strengths of the country and the foresight of the roadmap that's been uh, delivered. So I think one of the main points here, it's not always a good idea to do something first. Um, there are a very large number of lessons. So the UK, literally, we had to make it up as we went along. It, that was enormous fun, but it doesn't always mean that you actually come up with the best potential solutions. That often crops up uh, in, in hindsight. Uh, so do not copy paste the approach. There are much better ways of doing things in some respects. So Georgia does have the opportunity and has these strengths, of, as we mentioned, of education, technology, government, and the overall flexibility, which you tend to get in a smaller country, which is uh, actually a, an advantage. But good ecosystems, they don't happen by accident. Um, I have the concept of friction. Ecosystems must be easy to use and easy for all participants, because if you don't have that, you're going to reduce the potential for innovation. The people with the best ideas do not always have the best technical skills. And if they have to spend a lot of money or 
spend a lot of time getting into the ecosystem, they're going to be discouraged. And the only ones that are going to join in are the organizations that already know how to do it. So you're basically bringing in the incumbents again. So it's really important to try and build an ecosystem where the friction is low, ease of participation, low cost of participation, both in initial setup and in operation. And you may sense from that that um, integrators are not necessarily the solution to all the problems because they are commercial entities ordinarily within an ecosystem which has a strong social perspective. Uh, so it is important for each country to reach an appropriate balance where the country does not lose control necessarily of the ecosystem. And I have to say that there is a risk, in my view, that this could ultimately happen here in the UK, which would be very sad. Not necessarily that it's going to happen, but I think there is a risk because of the way the ecosystem was built in the first place. Strong standards and compliance. That's what let Europe down in, uh, because the standards were published, but they weren't detailed enough. So each bank did their own uh, variation on the theme um, and there wasn't any uh, 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 assessment for conformance to the standards. And Europe will continue to pay for that for quite a long time to come. It's a high friction ecosystem. It will work well. There are other great advantages, but it doesn't happen by accident. And uh, one of the things I'm really proud of is that we've been able to gain expertise from most of the successful ecosystems in the world. Now, this business, the right ecosystem matters a lot as the ecosystems get bigger. We started off with open banking. Um, it's now open finance, pension, insurance, telecoms in different parts of the world. And this means that the challenges of an effective ecosystem get larger. And so if you don't start it properly and as it develops, if you don't have uh, an effective roadmap, then there could be trouble uh, down the roads. Uh, such a thing, for example, happened relatively small scale in Australia, uh, where it was suddenly realised that the uh, the management of uh, consents and permissions wasn't actually detailed enough to uh, allow all these different industries uh, based around the consumer data rights uh, to, to work properly. And that's actually one of the reasons why uh, my, my friend and colleague went out to Australia to, to, to help resolve that. They've corrected it. Um, but you know, arrange, organizing an effective ecosystem in a more complex environment is naturally more complex. More users, more participants, more connections, higher volumes, tighter standards, multiple bodies creating standards. How do you ensure that that all works together? Uh, Brazil had a foretaste of that. Uh, Australia, as I mentioned, uh, had a bit of a hiccup, but is now progressing uh, very well. So in order to make the boat most of the potential, then these things need to be managed properly. It doesn't happen, as I say, by accident. It needs to be coordinated properly. And one of the things that I really enjoy uh, and very much look forward to, I, I hope here as well, is to support the regulators in looking at the fine level of practical detail of how you actually do it. It's important to ensure that each participant knows enough of each other's world, the regulator about the technology uh, and so forth, knows enough of each other's world to be able to have sensible communications to create the right roadmap. And that didn't happen, not surprisingly, it's bound to be the case uh, between the regulators underpinning uh, the technical standards underneath PST2 uh, and the actual practicalities uh, of running an open ecosystem. But this is all stuff that's known now and can be acted upon. So the trick is to ensure that these ecosystems are interoperable. Otherwise, you start getting friction again. But the good news is this is where everybody has much more potential of starting to earn money. So in the UK, payment fintechs are struggling to make money out of it. 
quite a few participants are kept afloat by investment money and their route to profitability is not clear. Um, it was the concept that you just had to launch the payment APIs and everybody would flood in. You take a cut for each payment and it's all done. Not as simple as that, unfortunately. Um, and another aspect, which is a bit more hidden, is that when you're just dealing with open banking, artificial intelligence, which could make a big difference, doesn't actually have very much to get its teeth into. You know, what can you use it for? Well, categorizing transactions. OK, fair enough. Giving a bit of intelligent advice, I hope, uh, on your personal finances, etc. It's, you know, once you've seen that, um, you know, it's not you don't feel it's going to set the world on fire. However, when you expose it to a much wider range of data, then it can start making uh, a, a real difference. And because payments are now embedded within broader use cases, you you apply your innovative skills not to the uh, provision of payments, but to the broader use case within an industry, which is why it's great to bring in people from different industries to um, uh, to open ecosystems. They might not know about open ecosystems, but if you show them enough, they are likely to be able to innovate whole new use cases. And we did some fascinating work on tourism, for example, which for a holiday provider completely transforms potentially the way in which the holiday provider can interact with the uh, with the holiday maker. Uh, Volvo is still a great example of this as well, where they identified that the um, uh, the biggest pain of acquiring a new car was the bit that should be the proudest. And that's when you go into the showroom and you spend hours and hours doing paperwork and so on. They want to remove all of that. They want to get rid of the whole thing. You walk in, all the checks online. They know enough about you, even by the time you walk into the showroom and you say, I'd like that one, please. And you drive out. That's it. They don't want people to be there for more than 10 minutes, not because it's like McDonald's and they want people to be queuing up and buying another burger necessarily, but because it is focusing on the owner of the car and ease of acquisition and ownership. Now, these kind of patterns are general. Each country with these broad number of ecosystems potentially can create its own unique profile of interoperable ecosystems. So each reflecting the local demands and interests. So, but there are some general comparative uh, comparisons that can be drawn from one country to another. So the profile can differ. And, but when we uh, investigated the potential in Georgia, we thought, hmm, agriculture, sustainability, that looks interesting. Let's have a look. About 18 months ago, uh, we were asked, can open ecosystems support small farmers in accessing green funds? And after about 10 minutes or so head scratching, uh, we came up with the idea of an ecosystem. So I'm going to use this as an example of the sort of thing that can be done with an open ecosystem. And if the country wishes it, we can build this in. It's got to be in the roadmap uh, so that the regulators now are planning for what could be coming up in the future. That's an important concept to try and build in. But what we did here was using exactly the same kind of architecture because the trust framework architecture is interoperable. You can use it in a wide variety of different circumstances. So let's design an ecosystem where the small farmers who normally cannot gain access to green funds can do so because we create a cooperative. They, they, they support each other peer-to-peer -peer support, they support each other, they combine the efforts that they each put in to a single green investment scheme. So we're now using an open ecosystem to bring these um, 
communities together. They could be local to each other. They may they need not be. It probably helps if they're working in the same area, like uh, solar power, uh, micro irrigation, you know, the, the, the usual stuff. Um, so we designed this. We also designed ways of cutting the verification and validation. As you're probably aware, verification and validation of uh, green projects can be expensive, and that excludes a lot of potential participants, and that means they lose the opportunity to earn some revenue. So we built this. Oh, oh no, sorry, beg your pardon. I've got to be right there. We designed it. Um, it includes hierarchical ESG reporting, which goes up through the hierarchy to regional government, etc., and also a direct sales channel to enhance the margins, because farmers, of course, uh, generally across the world don't make much money. And if the first thing you have to do to, to explain to them that they want to take part in a uh, in a green scheme is that their profitability is going to drop. You've got a big problem. So we've been designing this. We are collaborating with Andres Bayo University in Santiago in Chile. Um, we would love to talk to universities, potential collaborators in Georgia, uh, because some of the aspects I think that we're investigating there, we're collaborating early days with some technology startups. So micro irrigation, I mentioned, this is a new one that we came across recently, low cost cold logistics for fish farming. Um, that I think you know, that could be a significant thing. We'd love to help get this kind of thing going within an open framework as part of the roadmap for longer term development. And the great thing for the country and the individual, of course, is all this stuff is uh, is compatible with Article 6 of the Paris Accord. Now, education. This is another thing that I tend to go on about with open ecosystems. Every country, UK included, when they created an open finance ecosystem, had to go abroad in order to get the skills to cope with the demand. Why is that? Why not train your own people? This is a key part of developing Georgia as a hub. Because if you could train people in advance, you could use them on your own developments within the country. Subsequently, they're either working on the broader ecosystems as they roll out and or they're working for and in other countries. Because those countries won't have had the foresight to develop an educational program. Georgia can do. And therefore, it's it's an earner, an export earner. So that's why we're always so interested in things like national training agencies, GITA perhaps, and universities in Georgia, uh, because they have great contacts, they have the vision, they're able to do the research and get the training programs in place. So in summary, phew, I think we're just about there. We're managing this on just about on time, which is great. Um, so I think, and Grigor and I strongly feel, actually, that Georgia could be an example for the world. It's got a lot going for it. We know how to make these things work. And the technical advances since the early days have made this a lot easier. So, for example, the trust framework is now much easier to build than it was in the early days of open finance. Georgia already has a good reputation for leading the way. It can be the model for other countries launching the system more rapidly and better than would happen by default. It needs to be arranged, co you know, coordinated and so on, but you know, it is perfectly feasible. And so by taking this sort of strategic, multidisciplinary and coordinated approach, we believe that Georgia can become a, a regional hub for this new technology. It's create thousands of new jobs and become an exporter of skills. And I would highlight here that the only other country I've come across that did this deliberately um, in order to kickstart uh, and get the economy running was Estonia. Grigor, with his uh, expertise from CCAF, may know of others, but 
I think Estonia is a great example of how through education, planning and commitment, you can really make a big difference in this area of new technology. And I think the foundations for that are already in place and it's possible, perfectly possible to exploit those, to build on those foundations and create. So that's more or less uh, what I think I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> you have to forgive me. I'm not entirely sure what slide comes after this one because it's not telling me here at the moment. But, you know, we are only a small consultancy. I know that I've been talking, you know, big ideas, but I, I have had the enormous privilege and opportunity for working in open banking from the very beginning. Uh, by my nature, I suppose you could say I'm a little bit of a, a kind of an academic, quasi-academic, if you like, and I enjoy innovation. Um, in my own personal uh, desire, I like to do things that are intellectually stimulating, make a difference, and then we worry, if, and I shouldn't really be this way around, but we then sort the commercials after that. You know, at this stage of my career, I want to be doing things that are particularly, uh, you know, valuable and make a difference. And I'm delighted here to be, you know, collaborating in Georgia and hopefully as the surrounding regions uh, with Grigor. So that's it. Thank you uh, very much. Uh, those are my details there. Uh, there is a QR code. I'll leave that there for a minute, but clearly you know how to contact me if required. Um, I'll stop uh, sharing in uh, just a minute. And of course, although it's not on this uh, because it's too long a URL, uh, th there is a, uh, uh, a Calendly link that, uh, uh, that you can use and we'd be happy to uh, sit down and uh, chat to you. And here we are. That's my grady. OK, so uh, thank you very much, everybody. I'll stop sharing at that point. And hopefully, OK. Right, so open for uh, uh, questions. Um, I hope you found that uh, interesting. Um, I'd love to hear your uh, uh, feedback, any questions, anything we can't handle right now. Don't worry, we'll follow up. And uh, so thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for your time. Uh, any questions? Thank you. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, George. Anthony, thank you very much. Thank you for a great presentation and looking forward to cooperate. And I'm sure we will mm. now find the touch points, Georgia, and maybe if you will have some plans to visit Georgia, maybe we can meet and uh, discuss oh, like in that. more detail. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, is anybody coming to the UK next week, by the way, for uh, I was the, uh, I was planning to uh, visit the UK. No, you, you mean maybe uh, UK FinTech week? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I was planning, but unfortunately uh, could not uh, could not get the visa. We, I, I'm a little bit late to submit the documentation. And <laughs> yes, me too. I missed this opportunity. <laughs> Yes, me too, indeed. But uh, yeah, so hopefully, I, I mean, I do know the embassy have been ever so supportive of us, so very uh, uh, effective and and helpful. So I'm certainly hoping to meet up with the embassy uh, and ideally the team uh, that uh, uh, come over. I'd guess there are some from uh, NBG and so on. Um, but uh, yes, so we, we can continue the conversation uh, one way or, or the other. Um, any uh, thoughts from anyone else? OK, Grigor, would you just like to uh, uh, say yeah, sure. know, a few, a few yeah. words as well? Aftandil has, a, has his hand. Ah, yes, yes, please, Avtandil, please. Oh, yeah, I'll just ask one quick question. Please. Thank you very much in the first place for holding the event and for letting us join. It's been interesting for us to listen to this. Thank you. Oh, um, I work at PMCG, the consulting firm that's based yes. in Tbilisi, for those interested. 
Uh, yeah, we also discuss similar things in our company and how we can develop the fintech industry in Georgia and overall the financial markets. And we have also come across one issue that Gregor mentioned when he was talking about the challenges we have in the market, and that's uh, scaling up startups that uh, are in Georgia, for example, mm -hmm. in the fintech industry. But that's not limited to fintech, but I think it's an overall issue of the startup infrastructure. I don't think it's limited to Georgia only. I think that mm -hmm. uh, similar economies probably deal with this. Yes. And I was wondering if you have ideas how that gap can be bridged and uh, maybe perhaps how your framework can be a helpful tool for the business that are set up here in Georgia to be able to scale up and you know achieve uh, more success on the international the global markets. Yeah. Uh, yes. That, that that's a that's a very good one. So, in terms of the scaling up uh, life cycle, are you thinking about the point of getting from idea into production, or from production to broader utilization? I think the second one more yeah. than the first one. That was that was my impression yeah. as well from what you were saying. Um, yeah, I think it comes down to. Uh, creating Georgia as a recognized hub of expertise. So, for example, uh, if a fintech were based in Estonia and uh, wanted to launch internationally, the the awareness that Estonia is already a technical hub of excellence gets more attention. Um, so just uh, let's uh, just in Zula. Um, apologies to those who've perhaps just uh, arrived uh, a little late. There may be in a bit of a slip in the hour, but you're all very welcome anyway. And uh, I can be available after this uh, hour is up if anybody would like to uh, to continue. So the issues of scaling up. This uh, was your question. So. Uh, in general, establishing Georgia as a regional hub, establishing uh, uh, new use cases based upon a more rapid movement towards a broader ecosystem, I would suggest. Because if you are, let's say, for example, on one extreme, you come up with a personal finance management application. Well, when you come to the international market, you're going to find a lot of competition. And so making a difference there uh, is going to be a challenge. If, however, let's say, OK, um, apologies, it could be anywhere one of a number of examples, but let's just use the one that we're that I was talking about just now. Let's say Georgia went for an ecosystem that rapidly enabled uh, the, uh, the collaboration between many participants on green projects, um, including perhaps a direct sales channel and a direct investment channel. Now, that's going to be new. That, that will take you just as even within Georgia, if you come up with the same idea as somebody else, you're not going to get very far. If you come up with an idea that's based on something new, then you have an advantage and you have the opportunity and time to take advantage of that difference. Um, so accelerating the growth of the ecosystem to a broader, more topical uh, combination might be useful. So, uh, for example, if you were to go straight for insurance, OK, but you know, and important, but the opportunity for real innovation there that would then make a difference across the rest of the world might be restricted. Um, it's all insurance is also an area that's uh, subject, of course, quite rightly to regulation and regulation, although absolutely necessary, slows down the development of an ecosystem. So I would bet that because many of the green ideas that we've been arguing for here are not likely to be subject to regulation. We could get that ecosystem up and running in roughly the same time and in parallel with open finance in Georgia, which meant that by the time open finance is running, there are already other ecosystems that are compatible. That's built a broader environment for innovation within Georgia, which can then be applicable across the rest of the world. 
And that's one of the reasons, I mean, this is a, a little bit of an aspiration. I wouldn't like to try and pretend that we're there at the moment, but this is why I would really like to establish pilot schemes uh, around this, these whole sustainability concepts um, in Chile, Georgia and the UK, because it demonstrates the internationalization of the of the issue. And maybe that's a point that we can consider as well. When you're considering how to develop services that are suitable for international use, your market and your the scope of what you invent has to be international. It's not likely you're going to come up with a solution that suits the country and then just happens to be applicable on a broader basis. So research more, and learn, create an ecosystem that provides you with a big enough sandbox, if you like, <laughs> to, to, to invent. Um, now, did any of that make sense, Abton Dill? I thought it was a brilliant question. It did, question. it did. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I found it interesting. We just had a meeting with uh, people from EBRD's office in Tbilisi yesterday. Oh, and yes. we were talking about something similar, how, for example, in carbon financing, you know, there is a demand on both sides. Like there is, let's say, in Georgia, for example, and I believe in countries around Georgia too, we have a uh, large uh, scope where we can create like excess uh, carbon credits Oh, yes. But uh, there are also people who would be willing to buy this in the West, for example, in Absolutely. Asia. Absolutely. This is but what the Paris the, Agreement enables you yeah, to do. Yeah. But then the, let's say, infrastructure to facilitate like investments or payments is not necessarily there. And uh, mm. because it's hard to prove that you have, for example, somebody willing to invest in a project in Georgia from America or from the UK, mm. which mm. is why there's a time lag for development of the industry. Yeah, so I, I thought that there was some uh, similar thinking between that yes. and what you yes. just said. Yeah, yeah, I, I can imagine that. And uh, uh, by, by coincidence, uh, I, I gave a presentation in Berlin in February uh, on how do ecosystems grow up? <laughs> um, although the, the case there was a little bit different because I was uh, thinking of uh, banks who are looking for opportunities to make money because they've often been dragged unwillingly into the ecosystem and see that uh, the business that they used to own and they wanted to keep to themselves was, was threatened. So I was arguing for banks how to adapt to this new larger world. And fintechs, on the other hand, often rushed to market with services that were held, as I describe it, together with uh, string and sellotape um and actually aren't scalable themselves so you know how do you go through the process of perhaps a fintech uh, uh getting bigger more mature as a business um and i was recently on an accelerator program for another startup that i work with uh where it was uh, addressing these uh you know, sort of maturity issues within a fintech how to create the uh, the you know the maturity that's required uh, in a developing uh, ecosystem, but uh, that fits in then, of course, with your question of you know what do we invent, what do we do, where do we get the money to do it? Which is yeah, it would be it would be great if you could give that talk in Georgia too, not only in Germany, because yeah, I think it's useful for our banks and our fintech industry to listen to it as well. I'd love it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's fine. Um, one of the reasons why I was uh, you know, making, I suppose, pretty honest statements, you know, on LinkedIn, everything is fabulous. Everybody's wildly successful and so on. And it, that gets a bit toxic in my view. I didn't want to give the impression that, you know, we're, uh, you know, a massive, because obviously, you know, if you tell something that's just a bit gray and not true, well, that all falls apart and damages your credibility. So I wanted to be fairly honest and say, we're a small group, dedicated group, I hope that much is obvious, um, for creating change, which is why I like the Margaret Mead statement at the beginning. But essentially, we want to act as enablers with partners. And so, you know, whoever can open a door for these arguments to be heard and above all acted upon, then I'm happy to uh, to collaborate. So, yeah, yeah I think that's a fair point, Greg. 
Yeah, yeah. Greg, what, what do you think? Do you have uh, any thoughts yeah, I, on I, that? I, just to go to uh, Tindall's question about the, you know, how, how do you actually go beyond the kind of startup stage and how, you know, how do companies actually scale? I think I think there's a lot of funding available and support for very early stage companies. And I think, uh, you know, in the UK, it's a very big problem. You have thousands of fintech companies that start and don't get anywhere. Um, I think open banking provide some support for that, but it's definitely not the not the solution. I mean, you know, you, you, I, I work for two fintech companies. One was an alternative credit reference agency. So they got, they used open banking data to do assessments on individuals and try and give loans more precisely than banks might be able to do them by developing new um, forms of algorithm, uh, you know, and use using alternative data like social media data and things like that to try and predict whether or not someone was eligible for a loan. Um, the other company uh, was CHIP, which is a personal uh, financial management app. So they scan your bank account transactions, then move a certain amount into uh, a savings account. Um, you know, again, using novel approaches because they're, they're not banks that kind of using slightly different kinds of data, using uh, alternative source, sources of data. And I think for, for those companies to scale, I think that they required a lot of investment in um in in like marketing mm. in um kind of digital uh, digital advertising uh, it, it was a basically high high capital investment before they could begin to make any revenue and i think that is particularly in a smaller market is is a real challenge mm. and i think um in order to you know and there has to be incentive for those companies to to, to also um you know, be able to make some return on 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 the on the work that they put in, and I think, you know, being able to sell their company to to a bank is often the motivator in in the UK. Uh, in, in Georgia, you know, there's 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 a few big banks. I'm not sure that's necessarily going to be a massive motivation. Another thing is, you know, there's there is a capital market in in Georgia, but the amount of activity on it is isn't enormous. So again, you I'm, know, though, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt, but those are very directly linked things because there are you know essentially two big banks, then the development of the capital market gets complicated because those services that banks already offer, they don't want it to be done by other institutions. Yeah, those are very related it's, problems for us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah, so I, th I think it, I think it is it is, it is difficult. Um, I think so. So I think, you know, open banking personally, I think, you know, open banking isn't necessarily going to benefit lots of startups immediately but then there's other kinds of organization that can access that these new data sources you know it's uh, insurance companies um other forms of professional services companies can, can maybe access so I, I think it's not only startups that, that are able to use this it's also other kinds of entity that that, that might eventually end up de delivering better uh, products for, for consumers mm. you you also made me wonder gregor all of course with an open banking background, we used to be very uh, dismissive of screen scraping because one of the reasons for PSD2 was to uh, was to stop that and make things more secure, which is a bit ironic because people usually worry about the security of open banking, uh, but forget that uh, PSD2 was there in order to uh, enhance the security uh, because screen scraping was just not really reliable enough. Um, but that technology has improved and I work with uh, uh, with a pretty good German company who's got a very advanced form of uh, uh, data provisioning through alternative routes. And that, I think, is the key thing, because if you develop a service uh, which intends to use open finance, you don't necessarily have to wait for the APIs to be in place. Obviously, it helps if you know the data structures, but you can develop a service using uh, alternative forms of data provisioning and then migrate as and when uh, the APIs to enable it become available. And do bear in mind that publishing an API and it being highly usable reliably are two different things. Um, here in the UK, banks publish their APIs uh, and they said, fine, we've done it. Ah, they weren't very good. Uh, so uh, that that delayed uh, the development of open finance here in the UK. I was personally quite involved with that because as a non-functional tester by background, I knew how to try and 
uh, stop this, but uh, the remit wasn't available. And that's another area, for example, where the uh, the regulations don't always touch on the technical requirements. Anyway, sorry, I wandered off track there, but you don't have to wait for the APIs to be available before you can investigate solutions. And then that can give you a, you know, a, a more rapid route to delivery. Now, we are a little bit uh, over time. I'm more than uh, happy to stick around and uh, chat if anybody would like. Um, so I'll just put a call out to say any more questions. No, thanks. Okay. And um, likewise, if anybody wants to have a chat about anything, I'll I'll put my email into the uh, into the chat here. Um, really yes, that's yes, that's a good idea. We'll we'll be sending a follow up, and uh, um, fingers crossed. Um, I think the session has been uh, recorded. Uh, so ah, there we go. And uh, so the session's been recorded. It'll be available for viewing after. We had a great deal of interest uh, beforehand. I was delighted with that. And uh, so uh, onwards and upwards. And uh, maybe with a bit of luck, we'll be able to coordinate uh, um, uh, another uh, meeting, perhaps in a month or so's time, even though I've now recently discovered just how much work these things actually are. But never mind. OK, well, Thank you very much, everybody, for your time today. It's been a, a pleasure hosting you and uh, look forward to meeting again and we shall be in touch. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.